last night what I was attempting to do was to provide a kind of the theoretical framework or the background for the main purpose of this retreat. And so I was establishing stuff like understanding the energy distribution between that side of the veil and this side of the veil and give you some idea about the kind of the protocols involved in LBL, life between life sessions. So I was trying to re uh, create the uh, the foundation, uh, talking about reincarnation, uh, past lives, parallel lives, that kind of stuff. So you have some idea of the uh, the context and the theoretical background to what I'm going to be sharing for the rest of the retreat. Now, so the rest of the retreat, I'm going to make some personal comments before I begin. And that is that um, this is going to be really emotional stuff for me. Um, it's uh, raising um, a deep nostalgia in me for home. So it may well be that uh, you're going to see a lot of tears here. Um, and from the compassion of your hearts, maybe you want to kind of offer words or gestures of compassion or whatever, uh, but I don't want that. I need to be able to kind of uh, navigate this material and process this in a, in a group format. I've done it for 18 years on my own. This is the first time I've ever attempted to do it with a, with a group or an audience of any kind. And so, um, no matter how much compassion you feel for what I'm going to describe, um, I want you to resist the temptation of offering me words of consolation or compassion or any gestures of the same. As I say, I've processed this material non-stop for 18 years. And it's informed, I would say, most of my homilies and all of the books I've written since then and lectures I've given. So in some senses, you know, those who have listened to those or read those books are, you know, have been kind of privy uh, to the insights that came, but not to the personal kind of experience that was there. So I really thank you for attending today and um, offering your energy and your love for what's going to happen during the rest of this retreat. So normally, as I speak and I give lectures, you know, I tend to speak really, really quickly. Um, and I tend to just operate from a very short outline of what I want to say and then extrapolate from key words and, and kind of get a wing it. That's my style typically. But this material is so dense. It was a four hour long session in a deeply hypnotic state. And so as I listen to the the uh, tran the uh, the tape recordings and transcribe them, um, I needed to read out the tra to write out the transcript in detail to, to cover all the essentials. So um, it's going to involve today a lot of reading of the material rather than lecturing or kind of uh, going off 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 uh, off the cuff kinds of material. I'd be sticking very very closely to the transcript that I trans transcribed. Um, and as I read it, I'll have to identify two voices continually. Uh, the voice of uh, Matt McKay, who is leading the, the session for me, and then my own voice. So I'd have to say Matt or Sean, Matt or Sean. So forgive me for the kind of repetitious nature of it, but I want you to understand what questions Matt is asking and of what my answers are. And one of the things you'll discover is that Matt is a very, very good facilitator. There are no leading questions in this entire four-hour four process. He asked very open questions that allowed me to go where I needed to go. And there was no kind of uh, pushing me in a direction that he wanted the, the session to go in. So as a kind of a, a facilitator and a hypnotherapist, he was absolutely excellent. Now, since it's a, a transcript of an oral tape spoken in deep, deep, deep hypnosis, sometimes the language structure isn't perfect. But it's actually it's a, an extremely accurate account of uh, what actually what I actually said in the tape itself. Now there were a few times as I listened to the tapes that I couldn't quite hear Matt's questions, so I had to infer the questions based on the uh, responses I made. But in the actual session itself, eighteen years ago, I could hear him perfectly, and the reason was that Matt was tape recording it. I need the tape recorder right next to me. I'm lying on a couch, so he's further away from the tape recorder than I am. So on a few occasions, you know, listening to the tape, I couldn't quite hear what the question was, but I could understand it. I could infer it immediately from the answers that, that I, I gave to him. Now, on my Sean self, in where I tend to speak really, really quickly, in this LBL, I spoke really, really slowly. 
And sometimes there were long pauses between sentences because I was totally caught up in what I was witnessing on the other side completely. And so occasionally there were these long pauses. So I'm going to have to try to represent that by the manner in which I read the material this morning. So you have some sense of what the experience was like. Um, in some senses, Matt's questions were almost distracting. And there was some part of me that was almost resentful that he was kind of, kind of inserting himself into what he was experiencing at the other side. No, he needed to do it. But it was kind of distracting to me because it was forcing me to, the best way I can describe it is, to vocalize what were basically um, a telepathic, a telepathic, you know, conversations. So there's, it's pure telepathy on the other side, and everything I'm experiencing, everything I'm hearing, seeing, or whatever, whatever, it's a tele telepathic modality. I know I'm having to vocalize what I'm encountering. So part of me is distracted from what I'm experiencing, and part of me is a little bit resentful that Matt is intruding into the process and not kind of letting me just. Uh, experience it as it unfolded, but his guidance was actually really, really important. So the impression I got was like, I'm trying to translate from a very difficult and different foreign language, and I have to translate it into English, and trying to get the correct terminology to uh, adequately express what the original language is saying. And it was a telepathic language that I'm now trying to vocalize. So that's part of the difficulty. The image that came to me this morning when I was thinking about that is, Imagine I was at a, a Super Bowl sitting in the stadium with 100,000 people, you know, watching the fanfare and the music and the costumes and the referees and everything else. And then somebody phones me and says, can you kind of explain to me what you're witnessing? And so for the entirety of the ball game, I'm trying to witness what's happening in the field. And in the stand, at the same time, I'm trying to keep a report to somebody who's on the phone. So it's really distracting for me that I'm having to do both things at the same time give an account of what I'm witnessing, which is kind of distancing me and separating me from a fuller engagement of the material. So that's part of the difficulties that uh, I encountered dur during the actual session. And uh, I will try to portray that this morning, you know, and during the rest of this retreat, by the speed at which I delivered the material and by the pauses, you know, that, that you're going to hear. And so I noticed when I was listening to it myself that I've used, I used the phrase... I get the sense that frequently throughout the, uh, the, the the session. And this was because all of the conversations on the other side were telepathic encounters. And so I can't even say that I'm hearing this or I'm seeing this. It's like there's a level of transfer of data and information, which is totally beyond the sensory modality and beyond conversational style. And so that, that was a clue to me that uh, the information I was receiving I couldn't say I'm seeing this or I'm hearing this. All I could say was that I'm getting the sense that some level of me is in touch with the material that's coming through. So let me get into the material at this stage. So Matt started off the session uh, with a very long induction to, so that he got me really, really, really deeply in. It took maybe 25, uh, almost 30 minutes uh, to get into that, that state. And so I'm going to represent Matt's voice now and then my own voice. Matt, picture your home at age 12. Sean, I live at 9 St. Joseph's Park in Mayfield, in Cork City, in Ireland. I see the front garden and the wall around it. And uh, I had sculpted the front lawn in the shape of the map of Ireland. Matt, describe the inside of the house and your bedroom. Sean, my brothers, Seamus and Porrick, and um, a visually impaired young man called Sylvester Byrne, whom my parents had taken in, we all shared a bedroom. It has bunk beds, and a small dresser. Matt, what's your favorite thing to wear? Sean, a jersey? Not a lot of clothes. 
I remember getting my first long trousers. It was a, a rite of transition. Matt, go back to the stair. We have time. You're four years old. What is your first memory? Sean, I'm living with my paternal grandparents at number 34 St. Rita's Avenue. There's a small front garden with iron railings. It's badly kept. There's a white thorn tree at the side and the back garden is full of nettles. Matt, can you describe your bedroom? Sean, I share a very small back bedroom with two of my uncles, Noel and Jack. Matt, what is your favorite toy? Sean, we made stuff out of uh, boxes and cartons. Once Jack bought Noel and me cap guns. It was a spontaneous gift. Matt, can you go back to an earlier memory? Sean, I had an argument with God at age four. My, most families were very poor, except for the Gunning family. I wrote to Santa Claus at Christmas 1950, and I asked him for a gun and holster. On Christmas morning, I discovered a small gun and holster by the crib. I was thrilled until I ran outside to play and saw that Pat Gunning had a much better gun and holster. I ran in home crying and asked my grandmother, why does even Santa discriminate against the poor? Then I threw my gun and holster at the figures in the crib. Matt, go back down the stairs of time until you're in the womb. What's it like there? Sean, great freedom, fluidity. I'm able to do somersaults. But there are some limits. I bump up against sharp corners. Matt, when did you join this fetus? Sean, I came in fairly early. I wanted to come. Some years before he died, I asked my father if he knew where I was conceived. He showed me a mossy bank near the Menard shovel mills and he smiled delightedly. Matt, was it hard or easy to get used to the new body? Sean, it was quite confining and my soul thought it was an ancient, almost antediluvian. Matt, was there anything distinctive about the brain of that fetus that Sean was about to join? Sean, it was equipment that was easy to work with. It was very bright. Matt, how did the body accept you when you came out? Sean, it felt easy enough. I was just learning the ropes, like each morning in a spacesuit. Matt, how does this body compare with others that you've had? Sean, my sense is that over time, bodies have gotten physically bigger. The species has evolved. So immediate health depended on environment, diet, living space. But bodies are getting stronger and bigger. Matt, why did you choose this one? Sean, because of the place, 
environment and people I wanted. My choice was limited by what was available by way, by way of spare suits. Matt, how did your mother feel? Sean, she was scared, anxious, tense, under pressure. I pushed the envelope by coming in when I wanted to come in. Matt, you're going to go deeper. The next step of the journey, you will travel through a tunnel to your most immediate past life. As I count back from 10 to 1, the tunnel will go from black to gray to white to a huge bright opening. You will find yourself at a significant moment in your immediate past life. Is it day or night, Sean? Day. Matt, is it hot or cold? Sean, very cold. Matt, are you inside or outside? Sean, yeah, outside. Matt, are you in a city, a town, the countryside? Sean, I'm marching. Matt, alone? Sean, part of an army. Matt, are you a man? Sean, yeah. Matt, are you small or large? Sean, I'm fairly thin, wiry, hardy, strong. Matt, you're marching? Sean, yeah. Matt, marching to Sean. I'm a soldier in the Russian army and we're marching into East Germany. Matt, year? Sean, 1944. We're trying to liberate a concentration camp. Matt, what do you see? Sean, sporadic shooting. Germans are trying to withdraw but fighting a rearguard action. It's really cold. We're marching, firing the odd shot. We see the... Matt, it's okay. You're watching with me from here in 2006. What do you see? Sean... I see the concentration camp for the first time. Emaciated figures standing inside the wire. Huge eyes. And there's the odd gunfight. The first section is women and children. I think I may be 22 or 23. Lots of their faces are dead. Hopeless, vacant eyes. One young woman, 19 or 20, a redhead, standing, watching me and a real connection between us. Part of me knows that I've known her before. The reason I'm on this trek is to set her free. I see the recognition in her eyes. And for a while, I'm oblivious to everybody else. My colleagues around me and all of the other figures inside the wire.
And I start to break ranks and to move across to the wire. And she reaches out her hand through the wire. And then I hear an explosion and I realize I just got shot. Matt, you just got shot. Sean, I see a look of horror on her face. Matt, she was reaching out to you. Sean, yeah. I can't set her free now. I can feel the pain in my chest at this stage. I got shot somewhere around here. I have my hand, my hand over my heart. And it's like, it's not just about not being able to liberate her. It's like, I've missed before with this encounter. These two souls have either been torn apart or kept apart in other lifetimes. And this was the chance to get together. It's not going to happen again. Matt, it's a big loss. Is it as big as the loss of your life? Yeah, I don't care about that. Matt, you've fallen? Sean, yeah, I've fallen. Two or three yards from the fence. I can't touch her, and she can't touch me. And some of my buddies just come up and drag me away. Matt, you died there. I'm just going to touch you on the forehead because this is an important transition. You've just died. Sean, yeah. Matt, you've been through this many times before. You can start to move away from your body now. As you move out, you can still talk to me. You can begin to see yourself expanding. As you look down in your body, you may have some feelings. Sean, the feeling is that I've played my part. I've finished the job. I want to try to give her some kind of a signal. Matt, what do you do? Sean, I send her a multicolored butterfly. It lands in her hand and it does a kind of a namaste. Matt, is it okay to begin to move? Sean, yes. Matt, just let yourself begin to go where you want to go. Just look around. Is there anything you want to tell me about? Sean, I see that there are many other souls leaving this place right now. Some of them really confused. Others ready to go. Some angry. Part of me wants to look out for them. Matt, what do you need to do? Sean? I want to look out for the guys who are angry and confused. Matt, you want to look out for them? Sean, yeah. 
so they don't get lost. Matt, do you have some work to do for them right now? Sean, yeah. We're high up in the sky. And far below us, we can still hear gunfire and shouting and explosions. Some of the souls are really confused. They don't know what's happened to them. Some of them are angry. Some understand what is happening and are ready to move. Matt, do you know what you need to do? Sean, yeah. There are two or three others. It's interesting. Some of them just vacated German bodies and we recognize each other. And we understand what we need to do. We have to use our military status and call everybody to attention. And then we have to explain to them what the situation is and where we're going. And it's like there were still military men. Rank doesn't make any difference. It's understanding now that makes for rank. So between the four of us, we get everybody's attention and we calm their fears. Matt, the scared and the angry ones. Sean, the scared and the angry ones, yeah. We explain to them that they have just ended a dream and that this is reality. Just like when they wake up in the morning after a nightmare and they realize that this is real life. This is their birthright, their true nature. And that there's no need to be afraid or confused. Slowly by slowly, they all let go of what's holding them in their fears and confusion and their anger. They're letting go of it and beginning to experience from the inside out who they really are and what they've just ended. Matt, protecting them and keeping them together? Sean, yeah, yeah. And one of the strongest teaching points is that they still recognize that those are German guys there and these are Russians here. But that the four of us who are trying to hold them together are Russian and German and that there is no animosity. That we realize that this was a drama created for each person to grow. And that rank and uniform or ethnicity are meaningless, just made up elements of the drama. Somebody starts laughing and it becomes infectious. And finally, the laughter is so loud that it drowns out all the noises of the gunfire and the explosions below us. And we say, all right, guys, let's move it. And now the realization is that we are going to move. But we don't have to move as an army anymore. Each one of us is going to go to the place we are meant to go to to meet those we're meant to meet. So there's a, a different kind of camaraderie. Matt, do you have any feeling about the past life as you help these men, as they begin to see? Sean, it feels like there are many ways of being a teacher, not just academic or school best, but that any situation of human drama needs somebody to help us 
figure out what it's all about. Sometimes the most important teachers we've encountered have never stood in a classroom in their lives, either as pupils or teachers. Matt, do you feel that you are a teacher in that life? Sean, I wasn't a formal teacher, but I taught something. I was just a young soldier. Matt, do you feel like you did what you needed to do? Sean, yeah, I did. Matt, what was it that you came to do? Sean. I came to try to meet this woman, this soul. Matt, this soul. Sean. I know who it is this time. Matt, you know who? Sean, yeah. It's Ireland. Matt, you came to meet her. Sean, I came to save her life and be with her. I didn't do the latter, but I did the former. She got liberated and set free. But she was never really free afterwards because she recognized that she had missed the moment. Matt, do you feel that you're able to move along? Sean, yeah. Matt, breathe deeply. So Corey's question is, did I remember that session without going through the tapes and notes? Um, the first thing I did, Corey, after the session when I got home uh, was to listen to the tapes. Matt had made the tapes and given, given them to me. So I transcribed it just longhand. So there was like an immediate uh, recording, an, uh, an oral version and a written version. Um, I didn't go back to them until about uh, two months ago. That was 18 years ago. Uh, something told me uh, when Karen asked about a subject for this year's retreat, that this was the time he needed to address it. But in the intervening 18 years, I would say my thinking, my speaking, my writing has been hugely influenced by that encounter. I would say it's probably the most uh, powerful spiritual experience in my life. And so it, it has informed everything I thought, all of my thinking about cosmology, you know, about the kind of the... Um, uh, what prejudices mean, what it means to be part of a fundamentalist system, whether it's Christianity or Islam or whatever, and to kind of get myself outside that. And in the ongoing sessions, you, I'll talk much, much more about that piece. But so I didn't ever go back to it over 18 years, formally, until a few weeks ago. But it has certainly informed my thinking, and it's my, all of my cosmology has been impregnated by that one session. So Michelle's question is, did uh, that right headed girl behind the barbed wire receive the message of the butterfly? Absolutely. So it's interesting, if you watch a butterfly, when it lands on a flower, the wings are extended, and it does kinds of kind of namaste. It continually does this namaste coming backwards and forwards. Um, and my sense was that although I had liberated her, you know, the camp was liberated. I was in, and it's interesting, I had never heard of such a camp, you know, and I, I did research afterwards that there was such a camp on the Eastern Front that was liberated. It was a camp dedicated to women and children, you know, and it was liberated in 1944. So I had my dates great. Um, so, uh, but she was heartbroken as well, because she got it as well that um, this was an encounter that had been prevented many, many times. And later on, as I speak, I'll tell you the reason behind that. There was a reason for that, but that there was either we were separated, kept apart or forced apart in many incarnations, and there was a lesson to be learned, and I'll talk about that in, in, in another session. But she got the message loudly and clearly, you know, that this was a this was a message from the guy who was dead at the other side of the wire. So Maurice's question is, after that uh, LBL session in 2006, 
did I recall, re recall any other events from that particular day to Mr. Russian? No, zero. That's great. So I misunderstood Mary's question first. So she's wondering, in my life before the session, before 2006, were there any indications, dreams or otherwise, about you know the meaning of that session or uh, what, I, what I was destined to encounter? It's a very strange thing that you know, I talk about preconception contracts where souls agree to be part of each other's lives and congregations and we come in, you know, and uh, I sometimes joke with Arlen that um, she got the timing wrong. She came in 17 months too late and she got the location wrong. She was born in Connecticut and I was born in Ireland. We were 3,000 miles apart. And then to make matters worse, uh, for her college study, she came out to UC Berkeley. So now she's 6,000 miles away from me. And to make matters even worse again, I got to Kenya as a missionary priest, and now we're 9,000 miles away from each other. And then on the 20th of May in 1986, I got kicked out of Kenya by the government for work I was doing in social justice. And I wound up in California, in Palo Alto, literally a half a mile away from Sheila, where she lived. And uh, um, I lived in the rectory uh, called St. Albert the Great. Some of you know that. And there's a little park nearby called the Eleanor Party Park. And I used to go down there in the evening after school. I was attending school at the Institute of, of, of uh, Transpersonal Psychology. And I'd go down to the park, and uh, there was a special tree there that I loved. And I would sit under it, and I was reading a book called Autobiography of a Yogi. And the park would be full of little kids playing football and soccer and people walking their dogs. And on the 19th of May in 1988, a car pulled up the very, very far side of the park. I wasn't paying any attention to it. And a woman got out of it with her dog and took the dog off leash and the dog bifurcated the park, literally went through everything in the park. There was other dogs. He had no interest in them. There were kids playing football. He had no interest in it. Ran straight to me and started jumping all over me and licking my face. And the woman came running after him to kind of apologize for his behavior. And uh, she saw I was reading Autobiography of a Yogi. And she said, do you mind if I sit down? So she sat down and that's how we reconnected. Yeah. So in some senses, no matter the fact that we were we we were born apart, we were physically, geographically apart, and t uh, time apart. That it took an extraordinary one of the most kind of uh, upsetting events of my life. One of the most distressing events of my life was getting kicked out of Kenya, and that somehow that's what was necessary in order for this for she and I to get together. So it reminded me again that you know any event in our lives can be harvested for good. There's always a reason that things happen. And the question then becomes not, you know, damn it, why did it happen? But, wow, I wonder why it happened. Yeah. Pat's question is, um, has Ireland done any regression or any a memory of past lives? And the question is, no. Uh, Ireland is Jewish, very, very, very convinced Jewish, but culturally Jewish. And up to the last three or four years, uh, didn't ever attend synagogue, apart from the time when she was a little child and went with her parents. Uh, in recent years, she's been attending online a synagogue called Central Synagogue in New York, which uh, broadcasts as a Zoom session. And on Friday nights, I accompany her. I, I sit with her and we go through that. But uh, um, she's not a religious person at all. She's not even convinced that life after death exists. And still, you know, they can do the, she's totally convinced that this event did happen, you know, and that... Um, uh, there was a contract between us at some stage to get together. Um, but we're very different characters in our cosmologies, totally different. And so she challenges me a lot, and I challenge her a lot. Uh, but we're soulmates. I have no doubt whatsoever that we're soulmates. But uh, she has no interest whatsoever in attempting a, such a session and trying to recover any of those memories. She's happy to be who she is, and she's happy that we're together in some senses, and that's enough for her. So uh, the question Wave and Dean had asked had to do with free will. And if it were so important to me and to Ireland uh, to arrange that encounter in 1944, uh, were, were we overridden uh, by the mentors who advised us or did they alter circumstances to make it impossible for us to meet? So my answer was this, that to understand free will, you have to distinguish firstly between the, the free will that allows, that allows enables us to kind of determine an outcome as this thing from free will that allows us to make an input. So we don't have control over outcomes because 
say in that situation in 1944, there are thousands of soldiers on the battlefront, there are hundreds of people in the concentration camp, and everybody has an agenda for themselves because we're all kind of self-protective. And so it's not that I and Ireland could override the will and the needs of you know thousands of other people. We were just a part of the jigsaw puzzle. So even the fact that we were kind of dedicated to getting together does not mean that we could impose our will on the circumstances, you know, and again say the will of the other people involved there. That's the first question, the uh, first part of it. And the second response I made was that we have freedom to choose the game in which we participate, but we do not have the freedom to change the rules of the game in which we participate. And I give the example like the rules of soccer and baseball and basketball are very, very different. So you can do things in soccer yeah, that you can't do in other games. And you can do things in, in baseball that you can't do. You, for instance, in soccer, only one person can handle the ball, the goalkeeper. And um, in soccer, you can use your head. You can hit the ball with your head. Try doing that in baseball and see what happens. And so you have to uh, realize that you have total freedom to choose the game. But once you choose the game, you know, you have to abide by the rules of that particular game. You can't play uh, baseball according to the rules of uh, uh, rugby. And so we have to realize then what free will really means. Free will is the ability to choose the game, the incarnational game in which I want to participate. But then I don't have the free will, uh, the ability to kind of dictate uh, the outcome of this game because there are 8 billion of us on the planet right now all with kind of uh, intentions to make to change the situation so we're on own benefit so michael podlin's question is is there a significance a significance to the fact that uh, there are so many recalls now of past life experiences my response is this that you know i've long held that time is an artifact of human consciousness it's one of the limitations we take aboard uh, during incarnation. So there's the, our cosmic uh, size shrunken down to a little space suit, our cosmic intelligence shrunken down to this little piece of wetware between our ears, you know, the creation of time because we're not bright enough to uh, grok the entire gestalt, so we break it up into bite-sized pieces and process it sequentially, thus giving rise to the illusion of time. And then fourthly, there's amnesia created for us you know, by about who we really are, where we've come from, what our origin is, and what our mission is, because part of the mission is to discover what the mission is. So I think that um, we're beginning to come to the realization that time actually is an illusion. Now, uh, native peoples, Aboriginal peoples, got that way, way back that they have a totally different notion of time, that it's at least cyclical, but certainly not linear, that it's not going from past to present to future. And so there's a new appreciation of what time evolves. And so the past life recall, you know, is a kind of an indicator to us that everything is available right now, that the Akashic records are available to everybody. And if you know how to access them, you know, not only is the past available to you, but the future is available to you. In the same way that I, I mentioned last night, that if you take a book, let's say a, a detective story from the library, you want to read this detective story. And I know somebody who does this. And this person, you know, can't kind of take the tension of working through the detective story with all the highs and lows and the anxieties in order to reach, you know, what the outcome was, who done it. And this person will start the book with the last chapter and find out who done it. And then go back and read the book, because at this stage, there's a much more relaxed feeling about it. So that's what's happening in a sense, that, you know, um, the ending is already there. And if you want to go to the last chapter before you begin, you can do it and find out what the final result is. I can tell you what the final result is right now. The final result is that there is only God. We came from God, we live in God, we journey to God, and we access God finally. That's the last chapter. It's the last, that's the last line in the last chapter. So if you want to know why you're here, there's the whole book. Now you can go on now and you can live it day by day, you know, and pretend like time is a linear process that moves onwards. Switch yourself. Yeah. But there's the there's the punchline. That's the who done it. You know who done it at that stage. Yeah. So the question is, why did I come back so quickly? Or why would somebody why is there such a short turnaround period? I was died in uh, 1944 and reborn in 1946. Why would I want to and why would I do it? So uh, from the literature, there are a few different explanations. From the literature, we get the realization that people who die in kind of um, very violent circumstances, particularly in war situations, 
tend to turn around very, very quickly. So one of the great researchers of, uh, of past lives, uh, reincarnation, was Ian Stevenson, if you come across his work. Ian Stevenson was a professor of psychiatry at the uh, University of Virginia, and he wrote many, many tomes on reincarnation. And he traveled to cultures that accept reincarnation as part of their kind of their belief system. And the peoples particularly who do that are the Inuit of Alaska, you know, uh, the uh, Buddhist communities and the Hindu communities in India particularly. And he's traveled to these places and he's interviewed people, you know, kids who uh, report uh, past lives and he's checked it out. And one of the fascinating books is, is a book with illustrated pages where a child will say that I was such and such living in such and such a village and I was shot in the head by a bandit. And they'll check it out and this child has no connection with that village. You know, it might be hundreds of miles away, nor does anybody in this family. And they find out he's right and he identifies who his wife was and she's still alive, you know, and who his siblings were. You know, and then they look at autopsies of the person he claimed to have been. And you look at the photographs of the autopsy and the wounds that were suffered by the original person correspond with birthmarks on the on the, the head of the child. So you got actually photographic evidence. And what he found again and again and again is that the people who die in uh, violent circumstances turn around really quickly. Literally, sometimes within within days, want to be conceived within within days. So the Inuit of Alaska, for instance, have a custom that when an elder is dying. They take a piece of charcoal and they make a mark someplace on the dying person's body with charcoal. And then for the next two or three years, they're watching the newborns within the family, looking for birthmarks that correspond with the location and the actual symbol that was written in the charcoal. And they say, okay, grandpa, grandpa is back. And so, uh, so that's one, one answer I would give to it. The second answer I would give is this, is that, as I said, time is totally made up. I remember I got, um, somebody gave me a gift years and years ago of a, a CD, ROM, a music CD, and I plugged it into my computer. And a disc comes up and it shows me there are 13 tracks on this. And I hit the play button and it plays them in sequence, number one, then two, then three, then four, then five, then six. And then I see another button and I hit it and it's a shuffle button. And so it plays them in random order. Yeah, I see another one and I can organize the order in which I want it to be played. And because I'm a mathematician, I decide I want to do, I want to hear the uh, prime numbers first. So two, three, five, seven, 11, 13. And then they go back and they play the even numbers and then finally one. And so I scramble it. And then I think, what would happen if I could actually simultaneously play all 13 tracks? What would it sound like? Now, it might be cacophony uh, to my ear. But if I were a higher order being vibrating at a different frequency, perhaps I could hear the individual tracks simultaneously and be able to process every single one of them at the same time. Now, that's what I mean by uh, kind of parallel lifetimes, that it is possible that I'm playing, you know, uh, different tracks all at the same time. And that since time is made up, maybe after this lifetime as is shown, I can decide that I want an experience as a slave girl in North Africa in the 1300s and create that experience for myself. And so the turnaround time in some senses is only an artifact of the illusion of, of time itself. So the question was, Elizabeth saying the intense sorrow that that soldier, the Russian soldier felt at not having liberated or you know, kind of connected with this red-headed girl, did that sorrow kind of permeate after the death? Did it influence, you know, in any way my lifetime has shown in, in this incarnation? So um, in, a, in one of the lectures coming up, I'm going to go into much, much more detail about that. What the purpose of, there was a purpose to that, to that sorrow, an extraordinarily important spiritual purpose. So I don't want to kind of give, give you the last chapter before we continue to develop the plot. Yeah. So I will address this in one of the ones coming up. Uh, and so obviously this was a hugely important piece of the lesson and the teaching and it wasn't wasted. Yeah. Thanks, Elizabeth. Shanti is of mixed mixed race origin, uh, African and, and Caucasian, and she says that as a child growing up, with people kind of were happy to say, "I am of Irish lineage" or "I am of Bolivian uh, kind of lineage" or whatever. There was no lineage for for Shanti, you because know, as a kind of the as a kind of the children of a, of a slaves, and so for her, not having a heritage to claim or to be proud of, you know, was really distressing to her. 
But then at some stage in her spiritual journey, she discovered this was actually liberating because she wasn't attached to a particular lineage. She was free to identify herself as a child of God. So, I mean, I think you got the message in spades, Shanti. You got it, absolutely. You learned. I I think God is giving you an A plus and saying, oh, you fully got why you are who you are. And so since we have something in common, yeah, you got um, you got captured and taken out of Africa, and I got kicked out of Africa. And both of us, you know, learned that there was a purpose to it. Uh, yeah. You for a more spiritual reason than I, in some senses, because it allowed you immediately to identify with your source self. And for me, it was to kind of meet my soulmate. So um, if you got an A plus, I got an A minus. 